So let's take a look at one additional type of multiple baseline design before we move on. So this is going to be the design that was the third one on the list that you saw before in which behaviors uh, are examined in different settings. Okay. So uh, as I think I mentioned briefly last time, the whole premise behind social psychology is that the environment can have a big impact on your behavior, right? the situations that you're in. And so uh, if you're concerned about that, then this is a perfect type of design to do. Right? Now, the example that we'll be looking at involves uh, a single subject. So we have a 17-year-old male who has been diagnosed with uh, autism and uh, mild retardation. And so the goal of this particular treatment is to reduce a uh, problematic behavior that this individual is having that's not uncommon with these folks. Uh, this person had a problem with uh, drooling. Right? And so they used this applied behavioral analysis approach and a uh, conditioning type of treatment in order to see if they could get this person to control that particular behavior. So just briefly, I'll tell you about how the treatment uh, was supposed to work. Right? So there was an aide that is with the participant uh, most of the time, and the aide would check this individual uh, every five minutes to see what the drool situation was like. And then uh, if they were drooling, I think it was a he. Uh, so anyway, if he was drooling, the aide would instruct him to swallow and wipe his chin, so essentially controlling the drool issue. Most of us just do this type of thing automatically, swallowing to control our saliva uh, containment. So every time that the participant did this successfully, he was rewarded with a small treat. Now this is something that they talk about in more detail in your textbook, saying that uh, one thing that might concern you is that by giving a treat, this would cause the production of additional drool, because I think it was a, like a small candy or something like that, but they found out that wasn't actually all that much of a problem. <clears throat> and so the idea is that uh, if the participant makes progress through this treatment, then after enough sessions, they should be able to reduce <coughs> the frequency of the aide having to check the drool situation and provide the instructions. So they're trying to train this individual to do these things on his own. Okay. And uh, they did this across three different environments. Right? So they uh, they tried this out in a standard classroom, right? so I think that uh, this person was taking part in like a special education class, and uh, this person also worked in a uh, community center, and so they tried the treatment there as well, and then observed the results. And this next one might, might seem a little unusual, but uh, this guy is taking a cooking class. So that seems like an environment in which drool is going to be an especially big concern uh, because you're around food and naturally when we see food and appetizing things we tend to drool a bit more. So that might pose a bit of a problem there. Uh, another major concern there is that, uh, you know, it's a big personal hygiene issue if you're drooling and then touching things that you're going to be serving to other people. So what they're essentially doing here is uh, testing for treatment integrity or intervention integrity. They want to make sure that this treatment actually holds up across these different environments. So they, they don't want to see that you know, they can give him the treatment in the classroom, but then in the other environments he goes back to his old <coughs> standard problem and it isn't effective. So now that we've outlined the study, let's go ahead and take another quick look at the results. All right, so uh, on the y 
x-axis here, we have the uh, average number of saliva pools per hour as measured by the aide uh, who accompanies this individual. And then uh, these are actually, uh, I think, the different days. So they, uh, they followed this up for quite a long time, as you can see. Uh, this looks like a multiple month study. And so initially, the aid is doing checks every five minutes, and then when the participant swallows, wipes chin, he gets a treat. Right? Uh, and that particular treatment is started to be administered right here. So we've got the establishment of the baseline, right? So not getting any treats or anything like that. And then they start it, and you see this relatively uh, quick decline, such that. Uh, the drool is becoming less and less of a problem. And then after that progress has been made, they stop checking every five minutes and just change that to every 15 minutes. And they want to see if it's still effective with uh, you know, slightly lower intensity of the treatment. And sure enough, it looks like it's still pretty effective. Right? Uh, and then eventually they discontinue the checks altogether and uh, it remains pretty effective. So it looks like, at least in the classroom environment, this seems to work. Right? Now, uh, we'll move down here to the uh, community observation. So this is uh, when he was working at the community center. And as you can see, uh, the treatment is administered at a different time here. So this moves over, right? and we have a longer baseline period. Right? And there looks to be quite a bit of fluctuation during this baseline phase. Uh, but then once the treatment is administered uh, and he starts getting rewards for consistently wiping and swallowing, then you can see this drop off such that uh, the behavior, behavior has come, become less of a problem. Then they reduce the number of checks and eventually discontinue the checks and seems to be doing really well. So this seems to be a really effective treatment, as you can see. Uh, huge difference between the baseline and then the end of the treatment session. And then there was that one additional environment, remember the cooking class, so this, is, this is the big one. And so uh, we had administered the intervention at this point, so it's gonna move over again for the cooking class. So here's the baseline, still a relatively high number of saliva pools per hour. And then the treatment is administered at a slightly later time, and you see this drop off again. Uh, now, they actually decided not to forego the checks altogether uh, toward the end of this one because of the fact that they were worried about some of the, uh, you know, the hygiene issues and uh, how this could be a, a real problem in a cooking class. But we see a consistent pattern across all three environments, right? So. Uh, this seems to be a big problem, but then as soon as the intervention is administered, uh, a lot of progress is made. And then by the end, regardless of the environment, uh, there are almost no uh, saliva pools per hour. So it seems like this individual has this particular problem completely under control after uh, a couple of months of this treatment. So, any questions about this particular design? Mm -hmm. Just curious about the, do you know from this, this experiment, uh, when they decreased the number of checks, but did they maintain the treat reward portion? Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not 100% certain on this, but I think that they were still giving the rewards uh, at every check when it was the 15 minute checks as opposed to the 5 minute checks. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if they were doing any type of reward when they removed the checks altogether in the other conditions. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So that's about it for the multiple baseline designs. And uh, the other type of design we'll talk about is that changing criterion design. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of class today, uh, this one is really closely linked to some of the principles that were discovered by B.F. Skinner. Now, one thing that Skinner learned is that certain behaviors 
will change gradually. So you don't expect to see a really rapid change depending on any type of intervention. Uh, and this goes back to Skinner's uh, uh, principle coming from operant conditioning, uh, that principle of shaping. Does anybody remember talking about shaping in one of your learning classes or maybe your general psychology class? So what was shaping all about? You don't have to be right on, just give me a general idea. Uh, shaping is uh, gradually teaching an individual uh, certain behaviors that lead up to more complicated behaviors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It involves rewarding approximations of the desired goal behavior uh, so that gradually that behavior can be shaped into uh, a really complex final product. And so a classic example of this is teaching a dog to roll over. And so that's a relatively complicated trick. Uh, and usually when trainers teach this one, they go through these different stages. So first they'll get the dog to sit, so it gets into a certain position. Then from there they uh, will lure the dog into a lie down position. Right? And then uh, after it has that down, they might teach it to stay. And then after it does that, then they'll lure it onto its back to learn play dead. And so there's this series of tricks that are trained in order to get to the ultimate goal of rolling over. So it learns to play dead, it rolls over on, on its back, and then it just has to perform one little extra step of rolling back over, you know, making the complete 360. Right? And so uh, this can take quite a while, unless you're really good trainer and spend a whole lot of time uh, working with your dog, but uh, it's really interesting that this is how it works through these gradual steps approximating that final goal behavior. And so uh, in the example we'll be looking at, uh, this isn't a dog training example, but uh, they were looking at an exercise program for, uh, I think these were some children or young adults who were, uh, some of them were struggling with some weight issues. And of course, exercise programs require a lot of gradual conditioning. You can't, if you haven't been working out at all, you can't expect to go run a marathon right away. Right? You have to gradually increase your endurance. And so what they did was they rigged up, the researchers rigged up these stationary bikes, kind of like you see in the picture here. and. Uh, they had them set up to provide the participants with a reward once they reached a certain intensity of exercise for a certain amount of time. So a little light would come on and a bell would ring and that would indicate that they would get some points and they could actually trade these points in for prizes. Uh, and as you might expect, they weren't giving candy to these kids, uh, but they could trade them in for things like comic books and other little fun toys. Uh, that would be you know, a positive reinforcement to the children. And so starting off, the requirement for getting a reward was relatively low. The kids aren't really in shape, and so they have to work out a fair amount to get the reward, but they don't really have to really get into this very vigorous exercise. Uh, but then they gradually increased the required intensity of exercise over time to try to get these kids to work up to a more solid workout regimen. And you'll get to see this uh, in just a second. 